you've tuned in to the 49ers Rush Podcast, and here is your host, John Chapman. All right, faithful. Welcome back to another rough week. Yep, another tough loss. We lose by two points uh, in the Kirk Cousins Bowl, which just absolutely hurts. It breaks my heart. We lose a tough one, 26-24. to Came down to the last minute again, and congratulations. We have broken an NFL record. We have now lost five straight games by a combined 13 points. It's never been done in the history of the NFL. Also, never has a team ever in five consecutive weeks lost all by three points or less. Um, or also us again. So congratulations. This is kind of who we are. We, we play these super tough, fun games, but just do just enough to lose instead of just enough to win. And we could have won this game. You know, we said it five weeks in a row. Definitely could have won, but more and more positives to work on. But we're still a very young team. We have lost the penalties battle every single game we have played all six weeks. And it cost us. We're the most penalized team in the entire NFL. Have the second most missed tackles in the entire NFL. We've scored the second least amount of touchdowns in the NFL. All these things, you're not going to be a winning program with with this many just inconsistencies and self-induced mistakes you have to force and control the game instead of react to and what we're reacting to right now but we're very very young so let's go through some of this stuff but before i do uh, i was asked by two different people what's your process for watching slash evaluating film and so let me just kind of go through this one i watch it live and i try my hardest not to make very many notes when i watch it live i just kind of want to be a fan after that it usually takes two to three hours for nfl films the game pass to get the film uploaded and they do a condensed and a full version so once that happens i go back through and i watch it all over again full time but it cuts out commercials a lot of the dead breaks so it goes relatively quick it's about an hour and 20 minutes and that i'm just following game situations momentum general feel for the game and just making game notes second time i focus completely on the offense and defensive line and i do the condensed version which is right at about 36 minutes this week. Then I go back and watch the entire thing again, and I only focus on the outside of the tackle box, namely wide receivers versus secondary, uh, quarterback reads, things like that. So once all that's done, then I finish and I compile my notes, which is what I go through with you guys. And then usually in about two days' time, Game Pass comes out with the coaches' film, which is the All-22, which is it shows you the expanded what the coaches get And you can see all 22, why it's called that. You see all 22 players the entire time. Every single player is in the frame. It's a very wide fan version. And then it also does a behind the quarterback or an end zone cam, which is the absolute best for any type of breakdown on O-line versus D-line. You can see very clearly kind of what the assignments were and things like that. So so that's kind of what I do. Now, unfortunately, the 22 film in the end zone isn't released uh, until a couple days so whenever I break this down with you guys it's just going off the condensed and the full replay so let's get into offense and our MVP congratulations this week goes to Trent Brown or right tackle who might be the best right tackle in the entire NFL Tennessee might have something to say about that they played Monday night but Trent Brown has been an absolute beast right tackle and it seemed like Three or four times when we were in crucial third down and short or goal line, we would just run it straight through the B-gap to his side, which is inside of him, because he would just push that defensive end all the way down to the A-gap, all the way past the center. I mean, absolutely crushed it. No uh, pass pressures allowed, and just absolutely great. Just absolute stud player. Uh, He's going to be a 49er for a very, very long time. Um, Brian Hoyer, absolutely terrible, went 4 for 11, 34 yards in one sack. And I had a whole bunch of notes about him, but here's the deal with Hoyer. He is no longer the starting quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. That's just, oh, it feels feels so good to say that. Like, Brian Hoyer is no longer the quarterback for the 49ers. And I'll say this, as soon as he got pulled, which he's been through a lot in his career, he was on the sidelines and he did his job. He was over there cheering, enthusiastic offering um, whatever he could during um, in between drives, so on and so forth. Just absolutely just great teammate, but so glad he is no longer our quarterback. We have a new guy, C.J. Beathard. 
This guy is awesome. Pick out of Iowa. I've been so in love with this kid since before we drafted him. Uh, I had him ranked as my number five quarterback, and he out of the draft, and he came in and played great. He was down 14-0, had a three and out on his opening series. Definitely not his fault. Uh, and his first three and out, he had two drop balls, one from Kittle and one for Brita. Uh, would have had a first down on both those throws. Both were dropped, punted it away. They kick a field goal, comes in down 17-0, to and executes in a flawless two-minute uh, offense into the half and scores a touchdown. Played absolutely amazing. His stats for the game, 19 for 36, 245 yards, one touchdown, one interception. The interception, don't really worry about that. That was the last play of the game. And, and I want to put that last interception as a huge positive because he gave his guy a chance, which is something we have not seen with Hoyer. He is very game savvy, and he understands what is at stake. And what I mean by that is he's not a stat guy. He's going to give his players a chance, whereas Hoyer three times in the past uh, four losses had not done so at the end of the game. So huge fan for that. He got sacked twice for 19 yards. Um, and again, he looked 100 times better than Hoyer at the start. He doesn't just dink and dunk to the sides. He likes to go vertical. And he created a spark for our offense and defense. I guarantee you, I went and I watched the the series right after Hoyer was out to the next series after that, and our defense was playing so much more enthusiastically. Like, he affected every single person on that sideline, and people were like, all right, let's see what we got. And we got a stud. We, we really do. Now, I will say this. Um, he made some great throws in that two-minute drill. Perfect drive, and I love Shanahan's call. We, you know, we we had the ball basically on the one with like three seconds left, and we could have kicked a field goal, which would have brought it to 17-3 into the half. But he said, "Screw it, let's go for it." We ran right off the left side, and freaking, it was awesome. It was, it was so great, and it shows you why people want to play for Kyle Shanahan. He is such a player's coach. And you could see even when Pierre Garçon got really pissed off at the end of the game on that piece of shit pass interference call, Kyle Shanahan walks out to the to field, calms him down, and you could see you could read his lips. He said, "All right, use this anger on this next play." It was awesome. Like this is who this guy is, and so huge fan of our coaching staff. Made a couple plays. Uh, definitely should have burned a timeout uh, late in the game whenever we took a huge penalty on a delay game. But that's okay. Uh, Kittle, our tight end, another solid game. Seven targets, four catches, 46 yards. But having said that, he had three drops in the first half. And you could see him just being pissed off at himself and hitting himself in the face mask and kind of cussing out himself. But if we've had two games where those drops were not existent, and he was amazing. If we can just cure this drop problem, we're going to be great. We're, he, he's going to be a 49er for a long time. That's the thing. There's so many of these young guys. You could say you're a young team and be bad, and that's not good. But if your talent is young and you're improving and it's good young talent, then we're solid. What you don't want is Deshaun Kaiser, who's super young but terrible. That does you no good. You want youth with potential, and that is constantly improving. And we have seen that with guys like Trent Taylor, uh, C.J. Beathard, who looked great in his very first game, uh, George Kittle. Like Trent Brown, we have so many guys that are on the stalwart of this offense that just look exceptional. And so it, it, it's a very promising future. Now, Pierre Garçon, uh, 12 targets, 5 catches, 55 yards, and he just killed it. We, he had 12 targets, and finally he led our team in targets, which you've heard me say. He needs to be the leader in targets each and every single week. Not enough. He needs the ball even more. 12 targets, not enough. And he just killed it out there. He had a crossing route where he caught the ball, took three steps, was able to get his head around. He had a safety coming full speed at him, and he lowered his shoulder and basically exploded the guy's head off of his bottle body. Nicholson head flies off. The helmet flies off. He's on the ground. Didn't look very good. Luckily, he got up. He seemed all right. But just an absolute beast all game. He reminds me so much of Anquan Bolden in his prime. Physical, wants to hurt the defender, and just catches everything that comes his way. 
The catch off of a tipped ball late in the fourth quarter was where he caught it, fell down to his knee. They ruled it incomplete, reviewed it, came back, said it was a catch. That would probably be any so many other wide receivers' best catch of the year. So far, that's his fourth best catch of the year. I've gone back and watched his highlights and from documenting them in the past. That was his fourth best catch this year. The guy has just been a freak. And that, like I said earlier, that, that pass interference call at the end was so much trash. That was such a terrible call. Uh, I was very pissed off. It could have cost us the game. I, I don't like to blame things on the refs. Uh, they're going to be good and bad calls on both sides, but that was that was horse crap. Carlos Hyde looked okay, not great. 13 rushes, 28 yards, but he had two, touch, yeah, two touchdowns. Uh, six targets, five catches, 47 yards. He bobbled a couple passes, but still brought them in. Wasn't super efficient like we saw in the first four games, but still got it done when it counted and kept us in the game. Ran really, really hard, but it was eight and nine man boxes every single play. We have got to get them to respect the deep ball, and if we can do that, then he's going to see more yards. But you can see this, and I can see why Shanahan keeps putting in Matt Breida, is when Hyde goes out, they pull back to too high safety look. When Hyde comes in, they roll that safety into the box every time. And so there's this huge difference between the fronts that these guys are looking at. And they even said this that whenever they were meeting the production team, whenever they were meeting with Washington's defensive coordinator, they said, we've got to start Carlos Hyde. He's the number one key that we're looking for. And so they're keying on that. Uh, Brita looked great. There was one point where he had four straight touches in the third quarter. He had a great catch on a 10 yard stop, uh, just kind of twisted his body midair and caught it with his hands. Looked great. O-line was great throughout the entire game. Run blocking's weak, and we've said this before, Fusco is awful. He's a glaring weakness that single-handedly crushed our running game. They would load up on him and slant one way or the other, and he couldn't do anything. He, he's absolutely terrible. We are a guard away from having a top-10 offensive line, and that is just – that doesn't even make sense. Lakin Tomlinson's been solid since he came over in that trade, and that's all we need out of him. It's solid. If we get solid out of our center and our guards, we are great because our tackles are second to none. They are so good. Now let's jump over to defense, our MVP of the defense, and this is so good to say. Solomon Thomas, first-round draft pick, showed out and completely manhandled several different men, including ex-49er Vernon Davis. Uh, Vernon Davis is having nightmares tonight for what Solomon Thomas did to him in the run game. Nine tackles, seven solo tackles, one sack, and two tackles for loss. Absolutely great. Pressure early. Uh, forced Cousins on a miss throw. Again, I said he had a sack. We only had one sack this game. You are not going to win football games if you are only getting one sack. That is inexcusable, but Solomon Thomas did his job. Um, let's see here. On third and one, it was great. On third and one in the third quarter, Vernon Davis, he's lined on, up on top of the tight end Vernon Davis, and he pushed Vernon Davis back four yards into the mesh point, which is right where the quarterback Cousins handed off to the running back and totally stopped this play for a fourth down. It was absolutely he did He doesn't get credit for the tackle on that play, but absolutely single-handedly made that play. It was great. Jaquiski Tart was okay. He makes lots of flash plays, positive and negative. Six tackles, four solo, and a tackle for loss. But you could see... They went empty five times, maybe more, but five pass plays, they went empty where every, there's no running back in the backfield, which usually means you're getting man coverage. And every time they did that, they looked to see who Jaquiski Tart was covering, and that's who they targeted. They were picking on Jaquiski Tart the entire time in the pass game. He played okay, but he gave up a huge touchdown on the opening drive. Um, they were picking on him. They, they clearly saw something in his man-to-man coverage. And it showed up in film. Eric Armstead played okay. Uh, he had a great nine-yard loss where he shadowed the pulling offensive lineman and tackled, tackled Chris Thompson, Tom, Thompson for a nine-yard loss. But he left the game with a hand injury. This is who this guy is. He flashes once or twice and gets injured. I really do think his days as a niner are, are numbered. I wish we could trade and get something for him because we need somebody else in that spot. But it is what it is. Buckner, solid as always. Good pressure throughout the game. Controlled the interior defensive line. And he's probably the best interior D-line guy in pursuit on the edge. Namely, if it's an outside toss or screen, the way he turns and gets in his pursuit, he looks like a linebacker out there. And he makes so many 
plays that he's just not supposed to. Brock Coyle, absolutely terrible. He's Nick Ballor out there, and we saw that last year. He has no understanding of pursuit angles. There was one play on a screen pass. He was in man coverage. He did two 360s, ran the wrong way, spun around, ran the other way, was so far behind that the runner cut back under him. He did another 360 to try to get there and finally made the tackle 14 yards downfield. Nobody even has to block this guy. Um, hopefully this is the last football game he will ever start for the 49ers. But we're getting Foster back next week. It, it's coming down. Also on Coyle, several times against the run, he'd be five yards back from his alignment. So he he would end up where the safeties are because he's so easy to get a block. Like he has lead feet. And so you can see him trying to diagnose the run play, but he doesn't move with it. And so it's very easy for the linemen to get him. I, mean, I I don't know why we let Bowman go when we did. I, I don't understand it, but long live Bowman. Uh, there's, there's a chance he's going to sign with the Cowboys, and we'll see him next week. So he'll be in San Francisco anyway. Ray Ray Armstrong played pretty good, but cannot guard a running back in the screen game. It's probably our biggest weakness now on defense, that and pass rush. And it all has to do with linebacker play. Not getting pressure on the quarterback. And we do this kind of cover three where we have Ward deep middle. We have our two corners screaming down deep thirds on the outside. And what we do is we flare out both of our linebackers, our Mike and our Will, about right on the hashes, about 10 yards deep. And the goal is let them catch the ball before you, then make the tackle. And it's a small three to six yard game. The problem with that is, Ray Ray Armstrong and Coyle cannot do that. There were several times where you could see Chris Thompson. He would just turn around and post up, catch the ball, juke, 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 and neither one of them would lay a hand on them. Uh, Ray Ray, he was the one that gave up the huge screenplay for 42 yards. It was one-on-one -on -one in the flats, and he didn't even touch Chris Thompson because he juked him so bad. And then he also got burned big time in the fourth quarter, by Vernon Davis. So that was huge. He he gave up a lot of plays. Jimmy Ward finally shows up, uh, made some flash plays. He had that awesome interception, which he barely dropped. But then he had the fumble recovery where he ran it down to the one and Carlos Hyde took it in. But he's showing up in turnovers. We need Jimmy Ward to cause turnovers. Richard Robinson, back-to-back -back good games, had an amazing interception against Vernon Davis. Seems like all the good and positive plays uh, came off of Vernon Davis. And... He basically ran a fade route for Vernon, and Kirk Cousins threw it up, and Richard Robinson basically over the shoulder. Willie Mays caught it for the interception. It was great. Eli and Harold made a couple big plays. Dante Johnson showing up again, saved a touchdown deep down the field. Great effort. And Akilah Witherspoon, our rookie cornerback, got in and actually made a tackle, his first tackle in the NFL. Got a few snaps, nothing special. Um, definitely is playing very, very scared and timid. It was a second and three, and he was in man coverage on the edge, and he gave a 12-yard cushion on 12 and three. And I'm sitting there screaming at the top of my lungs, scoot up, scoot up, scoot up. Uh, but the receiver just took four steps, stopped, turned around, caught it for a first down. But Aquilo made a tackle on the play, so I, I, I guess I got to give him that. Uh, got beat on a few crossing routes. He likes to look in the backfield a little bit too much. He needs to stick with his uh, man coverage scheme. Special teams. Robbie Gold's awesome. He finally missed a field goal, and it cost us. It, it cost us. But he's been legit. Trent Taylor, absolutely fearless punt return, an amazing 39-yard return where he had five different guys get a hand on him and broke all of those tackles for 39 yards. I wish we could get him a little bit more active in the passing game. The last two weeks, we seem to have gone away with that. And so we need to get him the ball a little bit more. Now, let's go to just a couple random notes. And this is offense and defense. Number one, we run way too much zone blitz coverage for our D linemen. We dropped Earl Mitchell into pass coverage four times and Solly Tom Solomon Thomas three times. Every single time we favored our D linemen towards Jordan Reed's side, but that's ridiculous. You do not want Earl Mitchell dropping in coverage. Uh, we did it three times in a row and gave up a touchdown. I absolutely hate that. Once in a while, I'm okay with it. But definitely, we did it way too damn much. Um, now, I will say this. We suck at guarding running backs out of the backfield, and we've got to get more pressure, which I talked about. 
And if we can fix those things, our defense plays well enough to win. We need to cause more turnovers, but we, we cannot continue to give up easy third down conversions just to backs out of the backfield. That's not winning football. Also, on top of that, I talked about the penalties. We had seven for 40 yards. Hey, second time this year, we've been under 10 penalties. But as I said, we're the most penalized team in the entire NFL, which it, it shows how young we are in new coaching staff. Injuries, uh, Eric Armstead, hand injury. Aaron Lynch had an ankle issue. Um, Ray Ray Armstrong was hurt several times, but it was more just like cramps. He kept coming back in. Calf, uh, Jaquiski Tart hurt his calf, but he seemed to be all right as well. Now, next week, uh, we have the Cowboys at home. And for the 105 kickoff Pacific time, the sh crappy thing is, this is the second week in a row we play a team coming off a of bye. Now, the 49ers are not being respected by Vegas and probably shouldn't. We're 0-6. We are six-point underdogs at home. Um, if, if you're a betting person, I'm taking the Niners with the points. Um, again, we've lost five weeks in a row uh, by three points or less. And we're playing at home. They, they're not going to have Zeke Elliott. We have now C.J. Beathard. Like I'm just telling you right now, not so much that I think we're going to get the win, but I think we're covering that spread. Now, having said that, we are 0-6. We are one of two teams that are 0-6. It's just us and the Browns now. The Giants just won their game, so they are 1-5. Um, so if you're keeping up with that draft stuff, just know it's us and the Browns again. 1-2 and two just like last year, so we'll see what happens with that. But hopefully we get Reuben Foster back and he provides the spark to our defense that C.J. Beathard did for our offense. And this youth movement starts to go full swing. Um, obviously, playoffs probably not happening at 0-6. Okay, let me say that again. Playoffs are not happening. There is no probably. Playoffs are not happening this year. But that's okay. We got a lot to look forward to. And we will see you next week. Stay strong, faithful. And remember, hit me up on Twitter, JL underscore Chapman. JL underscore Chapman. Take care, guys.